Hello, everyone. Uh, we are here for the next session, which will be the second Eric Java talk in this conference. And Piotr will explain us the more advanced Eric Java stuff. I hope most of you have been yesterday on the first talk about Eric Java. It will be helpful for sure. Cool. Um, everybody can hear me? Cool. Um, welcome. Uh, I see we have some survivors. That's good. That's good. Um, so a uh, small uh, disclaimer. So um, I'm not really sure if this talk will be uh, like advanced talk. Not necessarily. I mean, I will focus more on uh, practical use of Eric's Java since I'm working with it since like year and a half. So I will show you like. Uh, something from my experience, like how I feel about it, and uh, we'll try to show you where are we uh, in Groupon uh, using Rx Java. So um, I want to start with a, a small like history lesson just to show you like uh, from where come the motivation for us to use it. So I would like to start somewhere in 2008 where actually uh, Groupon was founded. So it was, of course, like hot, you know, startup. Everybody was putting a lot of expectations uh, into the company. And uh, as every startup, like the company was at the very beginning struggling uh, to, you know, to survive, to actually get investors, to satisfy them, and so on and so on. And at that point of time, somebody actually decided that let's go with Ruby on Rails. Like, let's build the whole platform on Ruby on Rails. And I don't know how many of you are actually using or have opportunity to you know, try that. So Ruby on Rails basically is like super cool technology if you are starting from scratch or if you are having like really small code base. It's giving you so much power that you can really develop like really, really quickly. And the thing is that when you are a small startup and you are really want to you know, provide features and so on like very, very quickly, like, that's something uh, really important for you. So at that point of time, this was like a really good decision. And, you know, like Groupon is still here. So yes, we survived after a few years. Like our code base was growing, our user base was growing, and so on and so on. So everything was fine. However, because this was like um, really um, somehow racing with time in many cases. First of all, nobody cared too much about uh, code quality, which is obvious. And nobody like, was looking too much into future, which uh, was, I don't know if good or bad uh, decision. However, it resulted in the fact that after a few years of existence, we found out that, uh, well, we are starting to have some kind of performance problems. And actually, we are not able to you know, develop so quickly. So some people started to think about it. And they came with this great idea, like, let's move to microservices. Because microservices, they are like solving all the problems, right? They are solving everything. Yeah, so <laughs> um, um, I have a feeling that if you will look like on the, our software development community, like around four years ago, and you would ask them like, yeah, microservices, like what do you think about it? Everybody would be like, yes, do it, like serval bullet, you will be successful. I don't know, like clients will be like killing each other to, you know, have business with you because you are on microservices, like this is the way. And after this first wave of this kind of opinions, you know, like, uh, and people who completely, like, don't understand why uh, some companies are using that and so on, they started to use that, they fail, and there was this second wave, like, microservices, oh my god, this is such a crap, like, don't use that, like, really, you want to, like, go bankrupt, like... Okay, I, I think like currently we are somewhere on the third wave where actually people are getting you know uh, more and more understanding like when to apply 
uh, microservices that the monolith, it's not something bad, and if you are doing that, it doesn't mean that you are worse, like, I don't know, them sinner is using monolith. <laughs> like, no, it's not like that. So it doesn't always make sense for you to use uh, microservices. Monolith is, like, in many cases, really perfectly fine. And the reason for that is that microservices, they, you know, they have like their own like pros and cons, right? They need to fit. So sure, you have like opportunity to use the correct tool for the correct job, right? You can uh, for each microservice you can use the technology that you really need. Which, by the way, like I don't know uh, if you are aware, but for example, Spotify, so one of the companies that uh, uh, first pop up to your mind when you are thinking uh, of microservices, they are, for example, using only Java on production. So they are not using anything else. So this argument is kind of... Anyway, uh, scalability, right? Uh, microservices, like you can, you don't need to propagate, like uh, uh, replicate your, uh, my, uh, your, your monolith on many instances. You can just scale up the part that is really struggling with performance and so on. Um, what's more, you have like clear boundaries. You don't have this one monolith where like everybody is working on. And when you need to implement a feature, you need some, you know, one of your colleagues to implement something in his package because you would like to use it, but he's so busy. So you will just go there, like, you know, like shuffle some ifs a while and so on and so on, and everything will be fine, right? Yeah, it's done. Like, uh. You don't need to thank me, like, what can go wrong? So you don't have that. You have, like, really clear boundaries, and in the same moment, you are building some kind of uh, specializa specialization in your team, which is uh, as well cool, because you are uh, becoming, like, a domain expert. So, yeah, a lot of... Uh, and those are, like, only few uh, of uh, pros for uh, microservices. But like I said, uh, there is drawback. Like there, there is, there are cons. And like, if you think about it, like eventual consistency, for example, not everybody can deal with that. And uh, if you think like about eventual consistency, you don't have this possibility to actually wrap everything like in one transaction, do all the stuff like all the writes, reads on your database, and so on, and then just commit or rollback, and you are fine. No, like. Usually, you have uh, multiple calls to other services, um, and they can fail, as simple as that. And when you are building microservices, you really need to think about uh, be being uh, fault tolerant, which is actually adding uh, a lot of uh, effort to the development that you are doing. So. Uh, that requires. Yeah, that requires effort. Uh, opportuni uh, opportunity, uh, operational complexity. Like, think about it. Like, one application, one monolith. Like, how hard could that be to you know to deploy and monitor that? And now think about like dealing with I don't know 200, 500 services that you need to somehow coordinate how they are deployed. Like each in different technology, each in like completely different way. You need to monitor them. You need to be able to actually track down where the bugs are. Like, this is getting really hard. You need to have, like, really quick uh, machine, pro uh, like, uh, servers uh, provisioning, uh, databases, like, everything. This is not an easy task. And think about, like, performance. So when you are having a monolith, you are just doing some calls on your local machine usually. Well, in the worst case, you are asking database for some data, right? And in microservice, you are replacing all those local calls to the functions with some HTTP or whatever you are using, which is going through network, and this is adding latency. So especially if you think about that each microservice is usually calling other microservices and so on and so on and so on, you are adding like really, really a lot of uh, latency to, the, to, to, to your system. And you need to deal with that. So because of it, performance is really, really important. And inside your microservice, you should be like as quick as possible. I mean, your logic should be really uh, making like best effort 
to perform very, very well. So how to do that? Um, there are a lot of ways. Oh, I skipped the slide. Sorry. Uh, um, okay, how to do that? So usually what we are doing in microservices, we are doing a lot of calls to other services. And this is how it looks like. So we are getting some ID, then for each ID we are calling another service to get some uh, details about the entity that we are uh, asking. And usually we are doing it completely in a synchronous, uh, sequential manner. So from response type, um, uh, from response point of view, from our service response point of view, like the time that we are spending on responding, this is like more or less some of all the calls that we are doing uh, to actually generate response. I'm skipping, skipping for now the part uh, where we are actually having the logic because usually it's relatively small in comparison to what we are uh, spending on calls to other uh, services. So how to do better? This is quite simple, right? It's uh, nothing new, no rocket science. Everybody knows that if we could actually parallelize all the calls, we are reducing the time of our response to the longer subcall in our uh, in our uh, service. So this is quite cool, right? Nothing new, nothing fancy. So how to do that in Java? Um, completable future. This is like one way to do that. Um, previously, we have a future for those of you who don't know what is completable future. Um, completable future is like extension to uh, extended idea of uh, future. So future lets you like encapsulate the logic that you want to run asynchronously um, and execute it on some other thread or thread pool and uh, thread from some other thread pool. And uh, that's cool, but. Uh, Anybody knows what's wrong with it, like with future, and why completable futures are better? <laughs> yeah. So uh, if you have a future and you want to get result, there is a get method, which you need to call. And in the same moment, you are blocking actually your thread that is, uh, that is uh, calling the get method. So you have a one thread that is responsible for computation, and you have the main thread that actually created it, and so on, and is waiting for a result. So this is not cool because actually, you know, your thread could do a lot of uh, different stuff. Not necessarily uh, it has to wait for the response. So uh, Oracle actually decided that, yeah, let's introduce completable future. And in this way, actually, you have a possibility to, you know, get the response and do something with it, uh, completely staying in asynchronous world without uh, any need actually for uh, your main thread to block on something. This is, of course, done by a callback and so on. And this is an example. It's super easy. And it's pretty fine. I mean, completable futures, they are doing their job. The thing is that they are not really good when it comes to work with multiple elements. So here, we are just returning some UUID strings and so on. It's very simple. However, when it comes to actually, you know, start emitting like multiple uh, items and so on, then you need to wrap that into list. And if you are still wanted to stay in asynchronous world and you want to parallelize stuff and so on, sooner or later you are ending up in completable future from list, from completable future from something, and this is getting like really ridiculous. So this is like there is nothing bad in this code. However, I, I cannot imagine somebody enjoying writing this kind of stuff. Like it's it's just really not cool. And the question is like, can we do it better? Um, yes, we can. So here is the same example in uh, Eric's Java with uh, observables. So just to have a comparison, once again, completable future, observable. Cool, right? OK. Uh, First of all, probably uh, before I will go to explaining exactly what it is, uh, you probably notice that here we are emitting list of something, and here, even though the code is doing the same stuff, we just have observable of string. And that's because uh, observables, they completely don't care about how many items they are um, emitting. This type is actually only telling you about, uh, like, uh, what kind of type it will be emitting, like the items, but it's not telling you completely about how many items will be emitted. So 
there is a possibility that actually this stream will not emit even a single uh, string, and there is a possibility that this will be actually infinite stream, like, which is uh, really, really handy. Uh, we'll see that in a moment, I believe. Okay, so what is Eric's Java? Uh, I'm pretty sure a lot of you uh, were yesterday on the presentation about Eric, so more or less probably you know. Uh, so let me just repeat it quickly if somebody uh, forgot. So Eric's Java in general is a library for, um, for composing um, asynchronous and non-blocking applications. This is like implementation of something that is called reactive extension, which is kind of guide about how reactive libraries should be, uh, should be written. And uh, it's not yet compatible with uh, reactive streams, so there is a version two point uh, something. Uh, I don't think it's even release candidate. So. Eric's Java currently is not compatible with reactive streams. There is a library for that. And in version 2.0, it will be. So you will have actually opportunity to, you know, to if you don't like Eric's Java, if you want to like switch that to Akka streams or whatever implementation, like your own, sure, you will be able to do that. For now, it's not possible yet. But like I said, there is an adapter. If you want to have it already, sure. Uh, you will really easily uh, find that on uh, GitHub. Um, the main thing in Eric's Java, the main class, like the core class of it, is observable. And you can look on observable as on a stream, finite or infinite, uh, of items that you are transforming and, um, and, do, and you're doing that in a synchronous manner. So how to create such an observable and what we can do with that? Here is um, Hello World in Eric's Java. Uh, in Eric's Java. Uh, create method, this is like really the lowest level method you can get. There are a lot of other methods like high level where you actually have uh, items that you want to like list of items that you want to uh, emit where you actually uh, can uh, transform some of your uh, futures or callables. I think there are there as well. What I'm showing that because I want to give you a feeling what is going on uh, under the hood because actually all those methods sooner or later they will call create methods. So here, as you can see, uh, we are accepting like creating lambda where we are accepting something that is called subscriber. Subscriber has like three important methods. Uh, on next, on complete, and on error. When you want to propagate something, you are just putting in on next, and then you need to remember to actually complete your uh, stream. Or if you don't want to complete your stream, this is perfectly fine. I mean, if you'll think, for example, about message bus, like if you are, you know, pulling messages from your message bus, like why you want to have like a finite stream? It doesn't make sense. Like you just want to have like this message flow, right? Whenever somebody pu publish uh, their something. So it's perfectly fine. And here we are just uh, printing it out in for each. In for each. Uh, here a little bit more, uh, it's not very complicated, but uh, so you can actually call on next many times, as many as you need, nothing fancy. The one thing that is uh, worth noting is um, subscribe on. So by default, observables, unfortunately, or uh, but this is like by design, they are synchronous. So if you will not provide a scheduler, uh, everything will uh, actually be executed on the main thread. So if you want to have asynchronous execution, you are just providing a scheduler, and uh, then er everything is going uh, on separate thread. There is a lot of schedulers uh, defined. There is a computational scheduler, which is usually a thread pool. Under it is, uh, I think, limited by number of your cores, and it's really dedicated only for uh, computational stuff that you are really that you can really do very very quickly. There is I/O, which theoretically should be used for um, non-blocking I/O because the queue is actually um, unbounded. So you don't want to put your computation uh, stuff on uh, I/O scheduler, and a lot, a lot more. Like here, for example, new thread. Okay, here example with error handling. So the important part about observables and errors is that 
errors are treated exactly, well, almost exactly in the same way as items. So you are propagating them downstream as well, where actually in your subscriber you can handle them and do different stuff. If you will not do it, they will just explode somewhere. So you should actually handle them. And as you can see here, for each is accepting like uh, the first uh, line in for each. This is like handling a regular uh, response when everything is okay. This is on, like on next and the lower, which is a printing stack trace. This guy is actually handling errors. As easy as that. Documentation for Erics is actually something really, really nice. This is Erics Marble. Um, there is, I think, even page ericsmarbles.com, I believe, something like that, um, where you have actually uh, interactive diagrams like that, so you can grab items, like, you know, slide them to see, like, uh, how the output will be different, uh, if the order of the items will be different, and actually to, you know, understand, like, have a feeling about what the operators are doing. So, uh, here, for example, this is uh, Eric's marble for filter. So as you can see, we are just filtering uh, circles. And in the output stream, you just have like two circles, uh, as easy as that. This is like very convenient, because usually, uh, for most methods, uh, the diagram is so easy that you really don't need to even read documentation. You are just taking a look and like, oh, yeah, I know what it's doing. Like, come on, like, no reason to actually you know, pay attention. Yeah, it uh, bited us. Don't do that. Um, and this is more or less how your code will actually look like if you start using that on production. So uh, easy or hard to read? So um, I would say like uh, you need to get used to that if you are working with Eric's. Uh, because uh, sooner or later, uh, everything will be war uh, using like that. Eric's is really addictive. You will start to put it everywhere. And uh, I must admit that there is uh, some uh, level at which I really have a feeling that I should just throw it away because it's getting like really, really complicated. And Eric's is uh, really not a silver bullet that will fit everywhere and that will make your life easier. No, it will not. However, in many, many cases, it's actually uh, uh, doing its job. So you will have something like this. OK, so we have seen like how to create observables. We know more or less like, uh, what's, you know, what they are doing and so on. So let's take a look on some uh, common uh, maybe patterns. It's like uh, too much, but some common uh, operations that we are doing, usually in microservices. Uh, and how uh, that fits into uh, Eric's. So let's start with something very, very simple. Uh, when you have like bunch of UUIDs and you want to like improve uh, performance of your service. So whenever you are calling, you probably don't want to like call one by one uh, in terms of IDs. You want to just you know probably create like bunch of them and push it in a single call or in some like I don't know two or three calls that depends on how big. Um, your uh, list of UUIDs uh, is. So uh, there is a really nice uh, uh, operator like buffer. So here you are just uh, buffering all the UUIDs that you are getting into a list of 50, and then you can uh, push it to some service to actually handle it. Uh, nothing really fancy. Um, retry. I mean, in microservices, come on, we are doing a lot of uh, retries, right? And um, it's built in as well. You are just actually providing predicate and where you are defining like when we should retry. Uh, this guy is actually accepting like how many times it was already executed and the throwable, so you can you know uh, create your predicate. However, this example is quite artificial because it's not including any delay and it doesn't make much sense, right? To uh, hit service like one millisecond right after it fails, like it probably will fail as well. So here is an example, a little bit more complicated, uh, with delay. Um, just to explain it like shortly, um, retry when is actually, uh, you, 
you need to provide to retry when lambda that will accept observable of exceptions. So this uh, error observable is actually emitting errors whenever they are uh, happening in uh, do HTTP call, and then you need to do something with them. And what we are doing is like we are zipping it with uh, observable that will emit integers from one to something, like how many retries you want to have. And then in flat map, we are just checking uh, if the number of retries is already like the limit, and then we are just propagating error further, or if it's like still fine for us to retry, and then um, we are just setting a timer, and after that many milliseconds and so on, we will try again. So uh, for people who are seeing like uh, Eric's for the first time, this could be like super confusing. Believe me, after some weeks with it, uh, quite simple. Um, okay, sometimes w the API that we are working with, uh, they are not always exposing API that we really need to use. And sure, like in perfect world, it will be like that and everybody would have time to, you know, uh, provide API for all our business use cases and so on. Usually it's not. So sometimes we don't have possibility to give like I don't know, like date ranges for some data and so on. We need to actually pull it until we will satisfy some kind of predicate. So in Eric's, we have something that is called take while. And here in this example, you are just, we are just doing pagination by emitting like uh, another page and another page, and we are getting comments until here. This is like, again, quite artificial uh, example because we are just uh, pulling everything in. Um, but you can just specify your predicate, and whenever the predicate is uh, still okay, uh, the source observable will emit uh, another item. So you will do another call and another call and another call. So this is as well pretty simple. And there is like plenty of this kind of stuff. So uh, even that it requires some kind of changing mindset, how you think about your code and how you're doing stuff, Really, a lot of this kind of operations is still uh, possible, and you need, don't need to be afraid that all of a sudden, I don't know, Eric is not giving you possibility to, you know, write uh, the code that you usually was like doing in normal synchronous way. Okay, so let's say this guy from Germany is like, yeah, it's telling like this that the Eric is super cool, and I want to use that, and how to do that. So adaptation for Eric's, if you really want to try it, is super simple. Nobody is saying that you are like that you really need to go fully Eric's and you know fully uh, asynchronous. Like if you have a part of your code that is executed uh, synchronously, you can just really simply just wrap it into observable, like uh, use the create method that I showed you, or you can uh, like here just use um, defer and put some subscriber, and all of a sudden you are in asynchronous, uh, asynchronous world. And because the systems that are not designed like from very begin to be asynchronous, uh, they are somehow like, they usually have this uh, line, this boundary, after which you cannot go any further asynchronous. It's not a big deal for Eric's because on each, like on observable, there is a method to blocking. And as fast as you will call to blocking, you are back in your synchronous world and you can operate normally. So if you just want to, like, for example, try Eric's, or you have a use case where actually you want to do some, you know, parallel call and so on and so on, just in order to improve performance, which was like exactly our case, how we started with it, like really, feel free to actually grab it because it has no dependencies. I mean, this is like really a uh, simple uh, library and this will not pull like, you know, half of internet into your project. Um, testing. Testing, very important part. So we all do testing, right? So Eric's, um, we should test observables as well. So JUnit is not like, framework for actually testing asynchronous stuff, right? If you would just define observable and provide subscriber, your test will pass and we are all happy and then you are looking on the console and there is a lot of explosions and you don't know what's going on, but your bar is green, so let's go production. Um, 
Eryx comes with a test subscriber, which is like very, very useful uh, tool. However, that depends like what you want to test. If you want to have like real black box, te uh, black box test, and you are only interested in the result of your computation, you can use the blocking method that I mentioned just a moment ago. Um, however, if you need like a little bit more insight into your observable, what's going on, like if there was some exception, how many items was emitted, and so on and so on, uh, this guy will give you that. It will as well um, block the execution uh, of your unit test, so everything will be fine. So um, testing um, of Eryx is really simple, as opposite to debugging it. Uh, hope you will not have opportunity. Uh, OK, one more thing. Um, some observables, uh, potentially, they will be time-based. And you want to test that as well, right? So Eryx works. Uh, uh, huh, how is it called? My god. OK, so whenever you are having observable that is working on uh, time-based, uh, so uh, observable is not actually asking you know your system, your clock, about the, the timing. Observable is always asking scheduler for timing. Because of that, there is a test scheduler which actually gives you possibility to move time like back and forth. So whenever you have some observable that is emitting an item like every five seconds or something, and you really want to test like the whole flow, but you need to have this five seconds, you know you don't want to probably do somewhere like uh, you don't want to wait especially if it's not five seconds, but like two hours. I don't know, something like that. Uh, you can just use the test scheduler and then uh, really move the time back and forth to see if everything is fine. I think this is called pure virtual time. That was the word I was, uh, that was, the word I was missing. OK, so uh, that's cool. We know how to adapt. We know, uh, we know how to test. And when we know we have some kind of feeling about it, I hope. What about tooling? I mean, when we are using a library that is actually taking um, responsibility for all the flow that we are doing, we probably would like to have like nice integration with other tools. And this is like a really a reasonable point. And Eric's Java actually comes with really nice integration with many, many tools. Uh, I will be just talking about three of them. So first is Retrofit. And Retrofit is HTTP client that is uh, completely annotation based. So this is like a really simple tool. You are just creating interface where you're putting annotations about like uh, what HTTP verb you want to use, what kind of query parameters, what kind of path parameters uh, you want to use. And the only thing that you are doing is just providing this interface. And when you have that interface, Retrofit comes with a special builder when you are just passing your uh, interface and saying like, yeah, I want to have implementation of that. And this guy is actually giving you ready implementation. You don't need to write a single line of code. Everything is there. What's more, there is a lot of other functionality, like if you want to have some uh, interceptors around your calls, there is a possibility if you want to uh, have some logging, like uh, there is a lot of things that actually you can uh, inject into Retrofit. And like, what is the most important part? If you have Eric's Java on your class path, you can out of the box without any changes, just return type observable of something, and Retrofit will actually build observable for you. So you don't need to really create observable on your own, which is really, really convenient. Next tool, Hystrix. Um, how many of you are using Hystrix? Oh, only one person? OK. Uh, how many of you are working with microservices? OK, so, good. Um, so Hystrix is, um, I like to call it like a fault-tolerant uh, library. So it gives you possibility to actually isolate all the points of your system when you are doing calls to other systems in order to actually handle failures. And you're doing it simply by implementing something that is called Hystrix command. This is like very, very uh, simple example. And I'm actually wrapping here a concatenation of string, which is usually not failing, right? Um, so 
if you think about like calls to other services, there is a lot of things that can go wrong, right? Hystrix is coming with a timeout, which maybe is not so unusual because you can have that on your HTTP client level as well. However, beside that, it comes with uh, other stuff, not only timeouts. So you can actually have as well, uh, you can limit number of calls that you are doing in parallel. So if the service that you are using is able to, I don't know, handle 5,000 requests per second, and you are hitting on the peak time demo with 20,000, <sighs> come on, this will not work. And if you are having something like that, probably you want to fail fast just to, you know, degradate like the response, but still to respond quickly to your user and give them some reasonable da data to work with. Even if it will be stale or something, it's still better. What's more, Hystrix uh, command actually implements a circuit breaker pattern. So you are able to actually define the threshold of errors after which you don't want to hit the service again. Because if the service is actually failing or having some downtime, right? Uh, downtime. <laughs> downtime. Uh, you don't want to hit it still, especially if you like. There is a potential risk that your call to the service will like hang for the time of the timeout that you have. So like, really waiting uh, 60 seconds for, uh, you know, response that sorry server is not there. It doesn't make sense, right? So you can define this threshold after which Hystrix will stop executing it. It's they, it's uh, opening the circle, and you are defining time after which it should have like probation period when he is actually hitting this service, and if the service is uh, responding, it's like closing the circuit. So this is like a really, really cool idea. But failing is one thing, and having some fallback is completely another. So in Hystrix, actually, you can implement a fallback as well. And in many, many cases, it really makes sense. So I really like the Netflix example for that. Uh, I don't know how many of you are using Netflix. However, like Netflix is uh, so neat that whenever you are like watching a movie, and somewhere in the middle of a movie, uh, like I don't know, somebody calls or something. So you are, yeah, okay, I will watch that later. Whenever you are, you know, wanna continue watching, it always remember where you finished. So it have this, uh, it has this bookmark. And the thing is that before Netflix introduced uh, introduced uh, Hystrix. Uh, they had this problem that if the bookmark service was down, you were not able to watch the movie. And it was not like you were not able to watch it from zero, zero. Like, they were not loading it because they didn't know where you finished. So when they introduced Hystrix, they actually put a fallback as a zero, zero, which makes sense because for users, it's much better, actually, you know, to, like, fast forward to the place where it finished instead of actually uh, not letting you watch your movie. Like, this is like perfect, perfect example. Uh, you can still, uh, in the fallback, you can have uh, some calls to other services, like uh, with some stale data, because sometimes it's really better to, to, give some, to give people some stale data. I really don't care if uh, Netflix will give me information about, like, yeah, recommended movie is that, and it doesn't matter that you watch it like 10 times last week. Like, still, it's better than having, you know, blue screen and telling, like, oh my god, no, please come back in an hour. So it's really, really nice. And Hystrix actually comes with, because it's from Netflix, uh, it comes with really, really nice uh, integration with uh, Eric's Java. So there is Hystrix observable comment, where instead of like here, uh, just uh, doing call or returning something, you are creating observable. And then they are, uh, before returning you that observable, they are doing all the crazy stuff, like registering some logic and so on and so on. Uh, what's more, there is a project, uh, Turbine, I think, it's called like that. So, uh, Hystrix is exposing some kind of statistics, so you can have like really sexy graphs about uh, how um, like all your comments are working, how many requests were okay, how many were not. Like, it's really, really cool, you should uh, look into that. Uh, the last tool that I want to talk about is Spring. Um, but before we will talk about Spring, we at first should talk about uh, Async Servlet API. So uh, it was introduced, I think, like, I don't know, like six, eight years ago? I think like a uh, long time ago, really long time ago. Uh, in general, the idea is very simple. So we want to decouple the threads from our application, from threads uh, in our server. 
So we want our server threads to be able to handle as many requests as possible and then push that to uh, your application where, uh, like, in a magic way, I will show the magic way how Spring is doing that. When the thread on application level will be done, will communicate with your uh, server thread with response or with error telling, like, yes, this is response, just stream it back, I'm done. So that's the idea. And Spring is doing th that actually in uh, two ways. One is a callable interface, which you can use from your, uh, which you can return from your uh, controller. And it's cool. However, uh, I want to talk about deferred result because it plays, uh, it plays nicely with, um, with observables. So deferred result is a kind of a small black box with a method like set error result or set result. And whenever you are actually uh, setting, uh, using one of those methods, you are setting a response value. So like in this example, you are just creating deferred result. You are returning it from your controller so the server know where the response will be delivered. And on your thread, you are actually doing some computation. And then you are setting if, in case of a result, of course, result in error, you are just putting exception or whatever happened. This, of course, uh, handles as well your um, this handles um, um, your uh, exception handlers. So if you will actually set exception, it will be translated nicely to your you know, HTTP response by your uh, controller handlers and so on. So it's really, really nice. Uh, and it fits nicely uh, with Eric's. OK, um, that was cool. Uh, I believe we have seen like some uh, potentially good technology for using, uh, but is it really that cool? And I don't know, maybe I'm just trying you know, to make grass a little bit greener. So yeah, partially. Uh, the thing is that uh, Eric's is hard. I mean, when you are starting with it, you will have a lot of problems. You will run into a lot of problems. Uh, the learning curve is like, uh, it's, it's not easy. You will need to spend effort and time on it. I remember like uh, one of the most funny, it was really funny debugging that. Um, one of the things like, for example, that we struggled with was um, somebody, for example, decided, you know, there is in observable, there is a method do on next, which is, this, uh, which is like created for uh, side effects. So we decided that, sure, let's put in do on next some validation, you know, so we are doing some calls, getting some responses, and then do on next, it's like accepting actions on something that is not returning any result. We decided like, yeah, let's put their validation and do some other stuff further. The thing is that somehow uh, we didn't notice, reading documentation, uh, that uh, dual next actually, uh, there is no guarantee that it will be executed exactly in a place where you put it. So there is a chance that it will be executed like whenever your items are somewhere like really, really further downstream, and this will be executed somewhere on some other thread. So we had this situation that sometimes randomly like server was failing because we were already streaming to you know to the client response and then like do on next started to work and wow validation no like you should not return that let's explode so that was super funny believe me like that was cool searching for this stuff was amazing so uh, yeah and believe me you will run into situations like that so. Uh, and really, like switching like your mindset to things like that, it will cost you some effort. However, like if you really want to go like a synchronous way and so on, this is like really really cool tool, and I think it's worth investing the time. The other thing is that uh, if you are using Java 7 or something lower, if you don't have lambdas, that can be pretty painful. We started with Java 7 and really. Uh, that was a relief when we started to use Java 8 with all the lambdas and so on, because uh, you don't want to have all everywhere those static classes and so on. Uh, debugging is really, really painful, and uh, that's as well you don't want to do that. Um, it's better to test it. And I think more or less this is it in terms of cons. I mean, like, there are probably others. 
but uh, to be honest, like for us, it works really nicely. I mean, we are using it, like my team at least, we are using it in every service that we have that we are owning right now. Uh, so whenever like we are starting from controller, from controller level, what the hell is wrong with me today? Um, so whenever a request comes, actually we are straight away like starting a new observable and we are doing computation and so on. Uh, until we get to deferred result where we are just setting the response and you know going further and uh, it's really addictive so whenever you will start with it all of a sudden it's like yeah i know this is simple use case but well, those few operators and it's done like it's really really uh, addictive so um what can i say uh, highly recommend it works for us uh, we are having a lot of fun with it, uh, and real fun, not the one that I just mentioned a few moments ago. And uh, if you have some question, please, that's all. Thank you. <laughs> Do we have a microphone? <laughs> but then I will need to repeat. <laughs> oh, okay. Sure. Thank you. Uh, my question is, is regarding uh, retro retrofit URLs, uh, which you showed. Uh, can you can you add uh, their configuration? Because I saw something like version, which is version of the API probably. Uh huh. Uh, can it be configurable? Because I see entity, but uh, mm -hmm. I cannot see yeah. set. Any so uh, set. yeah, yeah. So whenever you are, uh, like I said, there is a builder that actually is accepting interface. Uh, there is a lot of uh, stuff that you can inject into that. So if you have like uh, you know need for uh, some stuff that will be constant, uh, like around all calls and so on, you can put it. You can actually put there like inject some kind of um, object that will be gathering this information from somewhere. So sure, this is like really highly configurable. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Then it's. Hard to see you guys from here. Uh, could you tell more about how Rx Java works with databases? Uh, how we can make uh, selects from database and use it as a uh, observable? Um, okay. Um, so there is actually a tool. There is tool for everything, I guess. Um, Rx DB. GitHub. Um, is it RxDB? Okay, I don't remember. Um, however, it was uh, recommended somewhere on the uh, Rx Java um, uh, page. So uh, this is a well-known library. So uh, yeah, there are libraries where you can actually have uh, the same uh, more or less uh, look and feel in terms of access to database. So, uh, you know, Fluent API that is returning you observables where you can actually do some, you know, uh, operations on it and so on. So, uh, yes, sure. Uh, the only thing is that uh, it was like uh, outcome of uh, yesterday discussion with somebody, I don't remember who, uh, that uh, because sometimes you really want to go like on a different threads and so on, and like if you are using Hibernate and have sessions and so on, you can have some problems with it. However, if you are just doing it in terms of like asynchronous manner, sure, you should be able to do that. You are just uh, at the very beginning of your observable. You are just creating, um, you are just creating a um, transaction, going further, and then like in your subscriber, you just have like rollback or comment, and there is no problem with it. I would say. Okay. Any more questions? No. No more questions. Okay, cool. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. And uh, if somebody has some question, grab me outside. Guys, uh, fast announcement that.